I got a free ticket. I got a free ticket cuz I got a golden ticket. And na, 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 na. I'm seeing this shit Tuesday. Ah uh, yes, the sequel to Prometheus. Yep. <laughs> you know what I missed from Prometheus? I missed Bob. Did you miss Bob from Prometheus? I missed Bob. I, I I wanted Bob in the Prometheus movie, but they didn't have Bob. It was horrible. Who the heck is Bob? <laughs> Come on, Mike. You know Bob. I I know Bob. Yeah. Prometheus, Prometheus and Bob. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be just kind of perfect? You have the engineer drinking something and Bob walking going, hey, hey, hey. And he hugs the engineer and they fall in the river and they create mankind. Yes, I wanted to see that so bad. That'd be so hilarious considering how the way Prometheus opens. I know. Oh, damn it. They had an opportunity to put Bob in there and they didn't. God damn it. And then, like, years later, when they awaken the engineer, it, it's, it's, it's just Bob instead of the godlike engineer. He's like, hey, hey, it's okay. I communicate with him. Um, hey, hey. <laughs> Explains why he goes on a rampage, because he's a caveman, not an alien. <laughs> All right. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then Max Fairbender's the monkey. <laughs> Oh god! <laughs> that's why he's. That, up. That's why he's fucking around with the crew because he wants to screw up their mission. <laughs> yeah. There can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead, make my day. Cinema Royale. Anyways. Welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, uh, where we keep it classy most of the time. Let me introduce you to my c- cinema bros. The f- First up, we got James Sullivan, also known as High Mitted. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by I Kill You! Roly Poly Fighting Style! Roly Poly! Roly Poly! Roly Poly! I want to question it, but it's probably best I don't. Thrust! Thrust! Roly poly! Roly poly! And last but not least, Morgan Ledger. Um, I would have a clever quote here, but um, I don't exist. <laughs> That's right. I'm just a figment of your imagination. <laughs> oh, so the guy who, oh, so the guy who told us all about these uh, these movies that are beloved by critics that he personally hates is uh, not really here. No, let's just say he currently has a hand up me. Okay. In fact, my real name is Howard Hand Up Me. All right, Howard. I, I, I kid, I kid. You know. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, uh, we are doing a continuation from our last uh, episode because this time we're the opposite. We're talking about movies that we hate or dislike, if you don't want to use the hate word, uh, of movies that everyone loves. So uh, we have our film choices. Actually, we don't actually know each other, so it's a bit surprise for all of us. So, And I'm just going to say for the record, if Matt is here, I know exactly what he would choose for a movie everybody loves but he hates, and it would be Toy Story 3. <laughs> I just want to see him like just fidget the keyboard going, how dare he insult me, dear internet! <laughs> well, well, Matt, if you're so insulted, you have to come hang out with us more often. Yeah, you do. Come on, Ooh. bring me the bat. Give me the bat. Give me the bat. Give me the bat. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he probably do some like Cloudy the Chance of Meatballs or Hotel Transylvania. Easy. Yeah. Some and easy, on, easy uh, stuff. And since we're naming those, uh, Devin would... I, I can pass it along and say, you know what? Devin would definitely pick Finding Nemo. 
Oh yeah. Because yeah, she can't. Yeah, there's no argument there. For years, that's been the the rant bone. She likes finding Dory, but she doesn't like finding Nemo. Don't worry, that's the middle ground. She likes finding Dory. That's cool. Well, that's because it's more about Dory than Marlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So... so we don't have a particular order, but here, this is what I was thinking when it comes to picking a movie that was critically appraised. Like it was more loved because I was tying into like the the score, whether it's on Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes, and maybe box office at most. And so that's how I chose my movie at most. So, For me, personally, what I always do is whenever a movie's released, I don't just look at Metacritic or on Tomatoes. I always look at the box office, um, what viewers think of it at the time, you know, like Intermovie Dad Base in a sense. Because there are some people out there that do have a split view of certain films that I like and they don't. Um, some people say The World's End is the weakest of the Ice Cream Blood trilogy. I think it's the best one. Um, some people hate Into the Woods. I enjoyed Into the Woods. Mm -hmm. So I really base it off those factors of what the audience thinks currently, and also how the film is treated currently, and how successful it was in, in its run, per se. Okay. Well... In that case, I can say that my my film choice uh, pertains to all of those. So I just want to make that clear in case we are choosing films that don't fit that bill whatsoever. So, because I would have been like, "Hey, that's not right." So, yeah. I I vote to go last because I want to see how you two are going to react to my dug up. Okay. Okay. The only question: cause, Who cause, wants to go cause, first? Because I I can't just pick one. This is like a firing squad of choices. Okay. Just a, a complete firing squad of choices. And I'm going to just say this once. There is one I wanted to put on here, but I already had the 30-minute spotlight of fame, and that was Spirited Away when we were doing fantasy films, and I wasn't mm -hmm. there. Right. I so, I so wanted to put that on there, but it's like I'm already going to piss people off with the choices I made, so whatever. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll bite the bullet. I'll be the guy who starts off. Okay. Uh, that me. I would have a laundry list of, of films, but uh, as I told these guys uh, uh, before, um, uh, before we started recording this, there is typically a tendency towards me in picking uh, these types of movies. Um... Uh, movies that uh, everyone else likes, but that I that I hate, and typically, uh, typically this is the sort of thing that you would see. Uh, uh, typically, this is my my judgment passed on this is the kind of thing that you would actually get really high rate praise from critics, and when there's the there's something defining between uh, between the. Uh, uh, me and most critics usually uh, usually if I don't like something that critics love it's I, I hate to I hate to point out this trend but it's true there's it's usually because of some sort of uh, it's it's usually because uh, some uh, some sort of um, uh, political uh, bent that the movie has that they that they love that I that I don't for whatever reason and I could go through those movies I could go through those movies but I I know how hostile people can get when it comes to politics and I typically try to avoid them on the show so on my own show so um yeah the uh, the film that I picked instead um, and I, and I, as we were sitting here talking, I came across another one with, uh, World's Greatest Dad with Robin Williams, which I absolutely hate the shit out of, uh, despite, despite the, mm -hmm. despite the, uh, the, the talent, uh, behind it, Bobcat Goldthwait and Robin Williams should be a, a hilarious team up, but I, I, I prefer to remember Robin Williams' better time, better years. Mm. Um... No, my choice is something 
directed by the guy who did Juno, uh, who never would have uh, who never would have been a director in the first place had his daddy not made Ghostbusters. Ooh. <laughs> I realize I did not realize that this was my choice until I just did the uh, the research right before uh, this podcast. The film that I'm going to be talking about is 2005's "Thank You for Smoking." Okay. Oh. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Directed by. I've, I've not seen it, so go on. Me neither. Directed by Jason Reitman. No offense, but. He did do better in Juno. He did do better with that. I don't know. And, I wasn't really a huge fan of that one. Uh, well, it was better than this shit. Uh, that, that's what I'm trying to say. No matter which way you break it in my book. Um, and starring... Uh, let's see. Some pretty, some pretty familiar faces here. We have Aaron Eckhart, Katie Holmes, William H. Macy, Robert Duvall, J.K. Simmons... Rob Lowe and Sam Elliott and oh and Dennis Miller. It was more or less a familiar face. So this is a low this is a, a low budget film, but it I I will give it this much. It's very professionally shot. Um the story is Aaron Eckhart is the lead. He plays Nick Naylor, a spokesperson for the uh uh for the uh the listed uh, Academy of Tobacco Studies. In other words, Big Tobacco. Uh, so he's uh, a defender of, uh, of the tobacco industry, shall we say. He goes, uh, he goes on, uh, on talk shows, and he makes presentations in, uh, in classrooms, and vice versa. He's, he's a guy who goes out there and uh, blows literally blows uh, smoke up everyone's ass. So why this is a this film is a satire of the tobacco industry. Now I don't mind that. I would uh, I I I could burn I I could care less about the ta- tobacco industry. I don't smoke. I don't I I, I don't promote smoking. Uh, but this film is so is so effortlessly mixed in what it's trying to say and how 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 unfunny it's trying to say it. And the problem is uh, the problem is this: Nick Naylor, uh, played by Aaron Eckhart, he's not a likable guy. He is it not even it, he's not even a likable asshole type of character. He's the reason why I say that is because in the first ten minutes, he, uh, he in the first ten minutes of the film, he flips himself on his on his own head. Um, it and it really shows you what kind of what kind of a person he is, and why. And why this movie does not work. Uh, the one of the first thing he things he does is he goes on he goes on television on a talk show uh, he, uh defending the tobacco industries again uh he's up uh he's up against this this mom and her son uh, uh who's dying of cancer or something like that and uh I, I forget exactly what the situation was but he's saying don't don't worry uh the tobacco industry has a uh, we we have a uh, uh, we have a, a thing a thing right now where we like to to give back and say uh, we'd like to encourage uh, ca- uh, I don't know uh, cancer uh, cancer prevention and whatnot et cetera et cetera so he's he's taking the stance that okay uh, okay people don't like smokers people don't like tobacco um, let's uh, uh, let's try to say what we have to to make ourselves look good, because this kid's got cancer. I can't argue. You can't argue against that. And what does he do next? He goes to his son's classroom, for I think it was a. I think it, it it's a. 
it's a bring in your parents day you know uh, see what they see what they do with, uh, for a job and uh, and the he turns right around and deliberately uh he deliberately uh requests that all the students in the classroom question everything their parents have taught them about why smoking is bad See the problem? Yes, no, maybe so. I don't smoke, so I can't say much about it. And I've not seen this movie, so I can't really argue much. But it's really hard. If you're going to take a hot topic like this... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And really trying to make this thing that's bad for us the good guy. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to put in that kind of position, especially the person who is defending this kind of thing, saying, oh, it's not that bad, you know, smoke, smoke, blah, 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 blah. I really don't see any pleasures in smoking. No. I, mean, I, I really don't. Smoking is is not really the issue here. It's 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 more or less... Here's a guy who's a who's our lead, who's supposed to be, who's supposed to be the guy that we're following, but he's a complete and total hypocrite. Well, even then, the originally we were going to destroy that with an ending where, in the courtroom scene, this was described. It was this was talked about in Doug's editorial, um, where he mentions at the end if he's asked, you know, when are you going to get your kid to smoke, and he said, well, when he has his uh, first cigarette, I'll allow him. And originally, there was an ending where. He's walking on the steps, and he sees his son actually picking up a cigarette. And mind you, I think his son's like supposed to be like eight or ten. Yeah, his... or something like that. And then he like slaps a cigarette out of his mouth, and everybody starts taking photos and putting the mics in and stuff, all because he goes back on his original word. Oh, it took him longer to go back on his word there. Yeah. Uh, it it's a little bit more it it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the. That's one thing he he's talking to his son in one scene, and the advice that he gives him is if you don't if you don't if you know how to argue correctly and you don't take a side, you can win any argument. Mm. Terrible advice. There's a reason why this kid's uh, uh, this why the, why this poor kid's parents are divorced. Yeah. Um. So. Yeah, he's, uh, yeah, th this is the type of person he is, and the conflict in the film is, uh, William H. Macy plays a senator, uh, Finist Finister? Uh, it rhymes with sinister. Uh, uh, who, uh, who's campaigning against big tobacco, campaigning against smoking, and in general, and wants to put a skull and crossbones sign on a cigarette packaging. Um, we already have a Surgeon General warning. It's in it's it's right there. It's in big letters. But no, I guess I guess the movie has has to put some sort of conflict on there without thinking it through first. Um. The, the, I, the, the problem is I, I end up, um, I, I end up probably siding more with the bad guy here than I would with the good guy because the good guy keeps on, uh, the good guy keeps on, uh, uh, sticking, sticking his foot in his mouth like, like crazy every, every which way he goes Everybody hates everybody hates him for it. Uh, he's uh, he's he's going around sleeping with multiple women. Uh, here here's another hypocritical point. Katie Holmes plays uh, a reporter who wants to do a story on him and gets to know him. Uh, they they sleep together, and uh, and that's how. You know that's how she gets uh, how how she gets the the information on him that she needs. 
to write a hit piece about him. So he feels double crossed after that. And uh, 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 she basically says, "Well, uh, well, you got to do what you get to. You got to do what you have to to get the job done, right?" And it was it was something that he said to her earlier. It was sort of an, an ironic twist on the same line. Um, so what happens to her? He calls her out publicly for uh, for. Um, for doing that, for sleeping with her, and she gets punished by no longer becoming a journalist. She has to be a weather girl now. <laughs> he gets punished. Uh, uh, she gets she gets punished for for being questionably amoral. He gets punished. How? He doesn't. Really? I, I was about to say nothing. Absolutely nothing. In fact, uh, uh, he gets to he gets to keep his he gets to technically keep his job. Uh, the the closest that he gets to to being punished, and this is where the movie comes close to actually being funny, is halfway through the film when uh, when he gets kidnapped by uh, some anti tobacco extremists. I guess those people exist. And they try to kill yeah, I think, him. I think they're. I think they're called the Westboro Church. <laughs> and um, they try to kill him by uh, by stripping him naked and attaching too many nicotine patches to him. I want to know if this can actually kill you. I doubt it. I would love if the Mythbusters were still around. I would love to see him do something on that. They already tackled the Golden uh, Finger myth twice. Mm-hmm. And uh, he does have a he does as after with this brush of brush of death he dive uh, he sort of finds that finds himself in the middle of a, a hallucination where he's in a, a cheaply produced uh, anti smoking anti-smoking uh, uh, PSA of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, almost works. Almost works. But the, if the rest of the film is so deplorable, I can't, I can't let it pass. Um, but yeah, he goes to represent the, the final sin of, the, of this movie. Uh, he goes to represent Big Tobacco in court. And yes, you're correct. Uh, the uh, the senator uh, does propose to him that that whole scene about uh, what would you do if your own kid smoked, that sort of thing. Uh, he stops and he thinks about it for a second. And in this moment, you get a look in his eyes like maybe there is some sort of conscience in this person. And he says, and he says, yeah, I would make them to, I would, I would, I would let him do that. I would like let him make this his own choice. And the rest of his argument is based around, is based around taking self accountability, and yada yada. We need to make our own, be able to make our own choices. So in that case, he wins. Okay. So what does he do next? How does the movie end? Oh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, spoil it for you guys. Uh, he he takes up a position. Uh, he uh, he quits working for Big Tobacco, and takes up a position working as a spokesperson for the cell phone industry. And uh, he's he's train he's uh, training people who work for the cell phone industry to say there is no discernible evidence that cell phone is cell phone use is directly linked to cancer. We're f okay. Now there's a, there's a whole nother debate on that. You know, uh, oncologists, uh, typically, uh, do disagree uh, typically do uh, disagree that um, cell overusage of cell phones does lead to cancer, but 
uh, at that time, it was still it was still a bit of a a, a new a new up and coming sort of concern. You know, could this lead to this and yada yada yada. And when I look at things in context, I say, okay, so he's essentially telling these guys that that they don't need to that they don't need to take accountability. That's the core of his argument. That's what he that's what they're you're saying when you say there's no discernible evidence that this leads to this. That that spits in the face of his whole speech in the courtroom about taking accountability. Yeah. He has not learned a damn thing. He is not He's still, he's consistently the same character throughout. No matter how close he gets to being punished, he's still, he's still just the guy who says, hey, if you don't take sides doing anything, you can win any argument. Ah! Uh, because consequences are icky. Consequences are icky. I don't, uh, I don't find this, this movie funny. Matter, matter of fact, when I, when I watched it, I felt like... Here's one, here's one, uh, one bit of irony. I, th I think there was some statistic I read here saying that no one, no one, smokes a single cigarette during uh, the course of the entire film. If that's true, why? How come after I was finished watching it, I felt like I smoked six packs in a row, chain smoked. And I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I've just hung around with people who smoke. I'll tell you why. Because they... This movie... It, it, it's, it's got this aesthetic to it that, that mimics what you might see in a... in... in a, a cigarette advertising. You know, even the credits are... Even the credits of this, this film are made to look like cigarette cigarette packages and whatnot. Mm. And there's something about the way that the film is tinted, shot, uh, that makes it look sort of like a Marlboro had, I, I should say. Maybe it's a... Maybe that was intentional, or maybe that's just me looking too far into it. Um... As a, as a person who, from time to time, encounters uh, uh, the, the effect known as synesthesia, I find it quite rather unpleasant. <clears throat> yes. Uh, so, yeah, I, it, if there's people who love this movie out there, if uh um if if you have a defense for it maybe i maybe you feel like i got it wrong somehow you know feel feel free to leave something in the in the comments um i I'd, I'd like to know what why do you like this movie why well, i don't get it i mean it's not a it, it's not a criticism of of you in of of you our viewers uh and in particular, but um, just you know, what's the what's the appeal of this? I I don't get it. The good thing I can say about Jason Reitman is, okay, so he he, he can direct. Um. Uh, he moved on to other other projects that uh, that were decent. Um, at least in my opinion. Um, other than that, really, I got nothing. So, that's my spiel on thank you for smoking. And I, I completely forgot that Doug did an editorial on it. Yeah, he said it was the most secretly shocking movie that nobody picked up on. And honestly, I didn't find anything shocking about it, to be honest. From the editorial? Yeah, there's nothing that just screamed, oh, must watch. It was just like, yeah, it's that kind of movie. It's a political, looking into our society kind of thing. And it's just, 
it's just the interest really didn't gravitate me. It just existed and just sort of shrugged it off. Hmm. Okay. Uh... Shocking movie editorial. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Oh, did you miss the most shocking film in years? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's the one. Mm. Yeah, maybe I missed that editorial, and maybe. And maybe you should miss the movie. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should. Um, okay, so... I had a really hard time trying to find a movie, because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a film buff. I rarely hate movies. Like, when... when it, there are certain movies that I do hate, but when it comes to movies that I hate, or I would say dislike that everyone else loves, it's going to be a tricky point because most movies that I hate are not critically, critically acclaimed. They're mostly like under the rotten bar, under on tomatoes at most. So I was on Netflix. I watched a few today. I watched as much as I could. I, I watched, what did I watch? I watched, this is Spinal Tap. That was, it was, it was okay. It wasn't bad. It was decent. I, didn't laugh at it. It was actually really realistic. Every, every band is like, oh, it's realistic because it's my life. Um, I saw Blazing Saddles. Oh, come on. So, that's a classic. It, it is a classic. But Piss on I not... you. I'm working for Mel Brooks. <laughs> I, there were some laughs in there, so I did like it. It was good for what it was. I didn't hate it, so those two were crossed off. Homer Bow is incredible. Sheriff is a nigger. What? He said the sheriff's there. No, I said the sheriff is a nick. Damn it. Now, now when you say that, make me laugh now. Damn it. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Oh, sure, you're laughing now, but when I say that's a whole different thing. Shut up, you. Um, I said klutz. I said klutz. <laughs> Shut up, you. <laughs> I, I, I didn't say I said klutz. <laughs> Shut up, you, I said. <laughs> I I watched I watched Homer Bone, The Incredible Journey. Mm. That was that was a classic from my childhood. Mm. But then I was like, but then I realized that there was one movie that I've yet to see. I always wanted to see it because it's the only said movie of the director that I'm going to talk about on Netflix. Uh, came out in 2011. It is the highest grossing that this, this director has ever made. According to, uh, as as of 2016, this movie uh, got 151 million one worldwide on a 17 million budget. Did you say a hundred and million yen? <laughs> Hmm. 151 <laughs> million worldwide <laughs> with a 17 million dollar budget I'm sorry I might slur my words a bit I, I I just first off it stars Owen Wilson okay. I I don't I don't get the appeal of Owen Wilson Is like this a Wes Owen... Anderson movie no okay uh, Owen Wilson is can be very comedic depending on the movie. Like I enjoy his comedic, you know, acting, but when you put him into a serious acting role, he just doesn't deliver as much as I should enjoy the movie for what he's doing. Um, here we go. What is this? This is Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris. Okay. Oh, okay. I've not seen it. I thought you were going to say Tree of Life, so... No. I... This is the only Woody Allen film on Netflix, and I was kind of curious what Midnight in Paris was. I was like, Owen Wilson's in it. You have you have a great fucking cast in this. You, you have. You have... Mind you, you have, besides Owen Wilson, you have Rachel McAdams, you have um, Tom Hilston, who plays Loki in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have um, Kathy Bates in this movie, you have Adrian Brody in this, 
and it's just actor after actor. And so, okay, okay, this is this is a romantic kind of comedy movie. Like I don't get the comedy. Like I didn't laugh at it. There was no. Oh, hey, laugh Adrian in Brody's in this movie. Yeah, he plays. Uh, what was it, Salvador Dali? I think. Yes, I'm Dali. I'm Dali. I'm Dali. I'm Dali. You didn't. Okay. You didn't find that know. chuckling. No, it was annoying. I'm Dale. I'm Dale. I'm Dale. I was like, really? Shut the fuck up, dude. Man, and Martin Scorsese was better as uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Kirikou saw his dreams. Oh yeah, good movie. Hmm. I enjoy. I. It's been a while since I saw this because I saw it once in the theater. Uh. And. Uh, I I just I just remember enjoying it because it was kind of a a nice little mystical uh tale about a guy living in American guy living in Paris who gets uh, who gets swept back to the to the 1930s uh 1930s scene and what's interesting is going back to that period and looking at and uh just sort of looking at it all from a a modern a modern person's perspective, which, uh, of course, it's it's impossible, it's BS, uh, how to do that, but on how he does it. But um, I kind of found, I guess, I kind of found it charming. I my rarely ear, see. My I ear, rarely. Uh, your your microphone's out again. It's fucking charming. It's fucking charming. Oh, oh, it's so charming. What's so charming about this fucking movie? Okay, I, I, I... Didn't like going back in time and seeing Cole, uh, Cole Porter playing the piano? Okay. Owen Wilson's character is a writer. He's in Paris with his fiance played by Rachel McAdams, which is so uh, so weird how she's cast in these time travel movies. First time travel's wife, then about love, and now you got this fucking movie. It's like she's being typecast being the wife of the time traveler in in a sense. Hey, there's your cinematic connection right there. It's like the next Stan Lee theory. It's just I was like, why is she in this Adams is the watcher. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Make it happen! Make it happen! I, I don't know why she's in these movies. That's weird. I just... But she's... Oh, she she goes back to her, like, Mean Girls roots, where she's, like, this materialistic, bitchy kind of girl, where she's, like... She doesn't even, like... Because Owen Wilson's character, Gil, he, uh... He's writing. And he's gonna marry her. And he, he loves... This is... If you love Paris, this is your wet dream movie. If you love Paris so much, you go watch this because it'll show you everything about Paris. There's like a, what, a three-minute montage at the beginning of the movie showing Paris with music. And I'm like, where's the credits? Where's the credits? The montage goes on forever. It's like, ooh, Paris, it's so nice. Ooh, look at this. (laughs) I mean, it, it looks nice. I will say the cinematography is like really spot on, but it just the character of Owen like the, the character of, that Owen Wilson does. He, it's the same Owen Wilson thing over and over. It's like he does say "Wow, wow, wow, wow." It's like I, I guess if Woody Allen's writing this, it, it makes sense to have Owen Wilson say it because he's the same bubbling idiot. Basically, because you. Hey, <laughs> because. Mike. Mike. Quel est journée? Quel bon jour? And what, a, there, what a day, what a lovely day in French. There, There is French in this. And you don't understand the French. I don't understand the French. They speak French without subtitles. And it's like annoying. It's like, what are they saying in French? You have to tell me. Of course, they translate it later on for the, the character to understand. But, okay, okay. Here's the thing that I don't get. 
and it is total like I, I I don't my suspension of disbelief is just out the door right now because he goes out, walks throughout Paris, and exactly at midnight, he gets teleported to the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And there's no explanation of how this happens. Like, if you're gonna explain how this phenomenon works, the it. it you got to do that somehow. It doesn't. Throughout the whole movie, it does not explain anything. It just happens. And and mind you, in the 1920s in Paris, I don't know the history. So I might have to look up the history. I might have to watch it again because, mind you, you have Scott Fitzgerald. You have Dolly, Salvador Dolly. You have Pablo Picasso. You have... You have all of these people in the same area in the 1920s. I'm thinking, were they in Paris at the same time? Like, there was no set date of when he goes back. It's just the 1920s period. So he's meeting up with Scott Fitzgerald or Hemingway, you know, and he's talking to his people, and there's, like, no consequences when it comes to time travel. Well, there's this one thing where he meets up a girl and actually starts to, like, romance with her in a way. Because he's, she's in between Hemingway and Pablo Picasso. You mean like the same way things were romanced in La La Land? I actually hadn't thought of that while watching while watching the film. What could be the possible repercussions of of messing with uh, time back in 1930s? But go on. But then he disco- he finds a book that the the girl was writing for like a, it was like a diary and he, he hears his name in the book so it, it like it happened in the past and he's in a book that she wrote and it's like okay nothing happens there's the repercussions it's 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 and of course everything that Owen Wilson says back to Rachel McAdams she doesn't believe because she thinks she's a lunatic for like thinking about the time travel thing. You know, it's like, oh, it's just a brain tumor, just a brain tumor. You're going insane, you know. And this movie is all about nostalgia because whether you think about what is the best, you know, era of you know of media when it was writing, painting, and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, because to him, Owen Wilson, he thinks the 1920s was the golden era of everything. And then the the girl he uh, tries to hook up with in the 1920s, she goes back. They go back again in time, which is weird. They go back to the 1890s in, in Paris. And she's like, I want to stay here. You know, this is my golden era. And then they start talking about how t- nostalgia, you know, there's people that go back and back and back because they think it's the best time in their lives. And I was like, okay, I kind of relate to the character in a way because my nostalgia for the 80s kind of does that for me where it's like that's the golden era for me. But it it plays with your mind about what nostalgia is and the modern present day. And like towards the end of the movie, he breaks up with his fiance. And in the, in the mix of this, he does meet up with a girl in present day that kind of has the same thing going on with each other. And they walk together at the end. It's like they they met like once and they're, they're going to start dating. It's like, what? How? Because they both ha- romantically have this, uh, have this uh, fascination with 1920s. No yeah, way. No way, makes... James, James, James. I want a divorce. Merry Christmas. Uh, I forgot to mention he goes. Yeah, when he goes back to the 1890s, they meet up with folks like uh, Toulouse Lautrec and in the Moulin Rouge and whatnot. <sighs> Toulouse yes. Lautrec. Oh God, I gotta explain this. I was in a play in fourth grade called Help I'm Checked in High School. And there's a gag where this teacher keeps mispronouncing, like, painter names, like, Pablo Picasso is Pablo Picasso. And there's a gag where he's teaching these kids a certain painting, and he mispronounces it as Toulouse Rock. 
And as he spells it out, everyone's so dumbfounded because it literally spells out the phrase to lose a truck. What? <laughs> it's that kind of play. Oh, wow. I just, I guess I'm not used to Woody Allen's writing it. I can understand his directing style and the cinematography. That's fine. But this writing, I don't like the dial. It was so boring to watch. Like I was like almost falling asleep watching it. And I had to like open my eyes like, oh, shit. What, did, what part did I just had to rewind it just to watch it over and over just so I can understand what's going on in the movie. It's just the dialogue is just bland. And I mean, the overall message I can understand because it's like all about nostalgia. But it's just like it's I don't get the character of of Owen Wilson and it's just wide I can maybe they should rewrite the movie where instead Owen Wilson Owen Wilson's character goes back to the 80s then maybe you'd have a little bit more of an uh, enjoyment for it <laughs> but but that's the thing though it's like no matter what time period you put it in it just it's a love it's a love letter to to, to prank the <laughs> to Paris because I I never been to Paris so I don't know the, about Paris that much and you know in in the era of the 1920s you know and all these famous arth- authors like Hemingway and Fitz Scott Fitzgerald and you know people like that you know I guess I'm not the history buff that I should be I guess to look into that and look into the the glory that is Paris so if you enjoy Paris if you like Woody Allen I guess that's the movie for you and if you do love this movie that's fine explain why tell me why you like this so much like i don't understand the movie that much i guess okay i i enjoyed it but if if it's the writing style that you dislike in this i would probably suggest maybe woody allen's not your not your uh director writer director exactly Exactly, and that's what I realized until I, like, this, this, mind you, this is the first ever Woody Allen movie I've ever seen, so unless I want to, like, if I had the same pattern with him, that's what's going to be, but I want to see more just to see if, I, if that's right or wrong. Mm-hmm. I actually found some performances of the play I was talking about. Oh, who did you t- <laughs> Yeah, oh I can't god. believe it. Oh my god. <laughs> this is like more than once. I can't believe this. But no, the the, the this is probably what might sound more interesting the Woody Allen play. It's about a bunch of kids that are transferred to a high school by accident. Um and what happens is the high school is more like a prison. The gym te- the the principal is pretty much Lee Army from from Little Jacket if he was crossed with um the brother from Weird Science and was like security guards and stuff it, it, it's really that kind of play in a nutshell mm. uh, okay. it, it, it was a class vote it was either that one or the one where there's a yard sale and a bunch of aliens invade or something like that it was, it was, it was, it was fifth grade. What do you want from me? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. So just so you guys don't feel like as if you're alone, I decided to go the extra mile and decide to kick more than one teeth in because I couldn't pick one movie. I really couldn't. Because there's like a collection of movies to this day that still really piss me off. Like, really, really piss me off. If it's brought up in discussion, I will seriously clench to avoid exploding into an atom bomb. Mm-hmm. So, just so you two don't feel left out, what are you doing? What's going on? What? What? What is this? Boy, what do you want from me? I did not have sex with that woman. I did not have sex with that woman. I don't even know her. The bitch was under the desk when I got there, okay? 
<laughs> it's a big moment. I'm gonna, okay. I'm, gonna film, I'm gonna film it. Oh, your your battery better be charged because this is gonna be a long one. So I decided to do a list of movies at one, two. Three, oh, four, Mike, three, what are you doing with an HD camera when we know you never use 11, it? Eleven, eleven, eleven movies to this day that seriously, seriously tick me off. Oh, and it's counting. I decided to range them from ones that mildly annoy me all the way to ones that extremely piss me off. And you have 39 minutes to do so. Okay, then. Let's fill up this time. I can do this lickety split. So I'm just going to start with the ones that mildly annoy me all the way to the ones that just, like, really, really anger me. First up, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Okay. I remember seeing that one in theaters, and I kept thinking, all right, well, this is okay. It can't be that bad. You know, everyone was hyped as hell. It got a billion dollars. But on second watch, I was watching my mother, and I started realizing there's certain things that don't really hold up as well. I liked it when it started off with the different characters, but then it started dawning on me. It's turning into more of a rehash and less of an actual entry. I know they were playing it safe and saying, okay, let's recreate this and recreate that, but I think they went a little too far. I know I explained this before, but the one point I would have walked out on was the death of a key character in the series. Because, not because I liked the character, but because if you're going to go this route and repeat this same thing from the first movie, then really, why should I give the attention when I already have a good idea of what's going to happen in the last third? Hell, when R2-D2's non-existent body appeared powerless, I immediately realized, okay, I know exactly where they're going with that. And you know what? It did. It actually did. So if I walked out of that movie at that exact point I described, I would have missed a single goddamn thing. I wouldn't even cared much about Mark Hamill's cameo because he didn't even have a single word. If you're going to go this route and recreate this whole thing, do something different. Don't just, like, erase the script and fill in the blanks. Just do something different. I'll give them credit for at least doing a different cantina sequence without the... Because if they had the guys in the background in the same number, it would have been way too obvious. The point where I started realizing exactly the similarities that's above my room um, was when they did the Death Star plans. Mm Because I kept saying, well, wait a minute, this is getting familiar. And then when they brought up the whole idea that there's this big, giant Death Star, that's when everything came together. I'm like, oh, you son of a gun, you didn't. You finally did it. You remade Star Wars. Yeah. (sighs) All right, so next up from that is... Remember, kids. Remember, kids. uh, If you're watching a Star Wars movie and something is going on on the catwalk, someone's going to die. So next up from that is Shrek 2. Oh, the one that what? the one that made that's... me like the series. I wait, 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 wait. That's the only good sequel in the series. I saw this movie at the drive-in when I was young, mm-hmm. and I was hyped. I was really hyped. I read newspaper articles on it. They were pointing out like all the little uh, adult in jokes and stuff, all the little meta stuff. And I remember sitting down seeing it, and I kept thinking to myself. I think this is a movie more for grown-ups and not for kids. Like, okay, so you have Shrek and Fiona meeting the parents. That's interesting. And then there's this whole thing where Shrek has to learn to love himself and be himself, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's fine. What really, really annoys me about that film, and this is quintessentially goes for like all the other films that try to be Shrek, is that they think the pinnacle reason why Shrek 2 was a huge hit was because of the adult jokes and the in-jokes and the metagags. And as it turns out, that's really all I remember from that film that dominates it so well. There's a scene where Donkey and Shrek are tricked by the king to go into the woods and they get killed by Puss in Boots. And he mentions that there's a bush that looks like the singer who's saying Goldfinger. And... Stuff like that is fine, but it stops the movie. Because if you know the reference, then you'd be like, oh yeah, that's kind of kind of... But if you don't know the reference, you'll pause for a second and be like, well, that was 
kind of weird. I don't see why they would put that in there. Hell, there's even a bit where the prince does like a little nod to like Lord of the Rings where he goes like a close up in front of the camera and the sword is like like this and a bird craps on his shoulder. Like, what's the reason for that? There's even that bit where like they're in the fairy godmother's factory and they're destroying all the machinery and stuff to escape and the goo they unleash comes across. Uh, overtakes the minions and they turn into like Lumiere and Cogsworth and, and the fact that the gingerbread's giant helper monster is named Mongo from Blazing Saddles mm-hmm. like adult jokes about, are fine I, what, I'm, about I'm, the, uh, what about Pinocchio wearing women's underwear oh Oh, that was the turning point for me. That was the moment where I literally was turned off by it. First time around I saw the movie, I was like, really, we're doing this? Let me me tell you, I hate underwear jokes. They're the lowest form of gags there is in existence. Captain Underpants is an exception because that is not the entire pinnacle of the series. It's these two prankster kids who are the good versions of Beavis and Butthead. Thank you very much. Um... But cross-dressing Pinocchio... No, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to put it. No, Pinocchio and William's underwear, that was the line. That was the straw that literally broke me. I was like, no, you're not doing this in a kid's movie. No, for love of God, no. I know that there's a ton, I know there's a ton of, of grown-up jokes I missed in the first film, but I didn't care about that because there was something interesting about the characters. Um, technically, this one had a better story, but I thought the humor was more dominant and more prominent and that really was what killed the enjoyment because there were too many jokes in there that was like referencing certain things and it's like oh now i have to understand about this oh now i have to understand about that and it just seemed like it going on and on and on and on but But what about puss in boots screw them Ah. i didn't like them i did Ah. not like them i am not kidding i did not like this character I just saw him as a parody of Zorro and nothing more. There was nothing interesting about him other than those big googly eyes. That's the point. That's what people like about yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. That's the I, I point it. of the it's, character. I get it. It's a kitten. Oh, yeah, and there's that little nod to Alien when he bursts out of Shrek's chest when he's, like, in his clothes and everything. Yeah. Like, yeah. I haven't seen that before. Austin Powers' spy who shagged me. Mini-me going inside Austin Powers' space suit. Oh, yeah. Moving up, uh, here's one that you guys don't care about. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Really? Yeah, you can have it. You can have it. I hate this movie with a passion. Um, this is an examination between the rising war of terrorism and stuff, and I guess it's supposed to be an account on the 9-11 attacks and the rise of terrorism. I remember seeing that movie, and I kept thinking to myself, okay, this one got a lot of praise. Why? And... The more I watched it, I started realizing this is a one-sided conversation. There is no other top to it. And when I realized it was that kind of movie, I was like, oh, God, we're doing this, aren't we? So it's supposed to be a chronicalization of the 9-11 attacks all the way to when they um, take out Osama bin Laden. And I just kept thinking to myself, this is more of a record of the terrorist attacks and not showing the other side of it. And I felt like it just got really repetitive to the point where I just really didn't care. It's like, oh, these people are bad. They're really bad. They're bombing us and everything. Look, yeah, I have a friend of mine who's a Muslim. Thank you very much. He was born over here in America. He's currently traveling the world, per se. It's difficult for him for the times that we're in. But you know what? He's a nice guy. He's a really nice guy. He's taking up illustration. There's actually, he's doing logos and stuff that's actually kind of nice. If people like that exist, and yet you're telling me that these people are bad because they want to kill us and blow us up and everything after what they did to us. Dude, I've seen Apocalypse Now. I've seen Bridge on the River Kwai. There's always another side of the story, and they don't do that in this movie. And that really ticked me off. And it gets that last act where they show how they went into the house and, you know, killed Osama and everything. It it really felt disappointment. It really felt disappointing because, one, they don't actually show it. 
it's off screen, go figure. So there's really not much of an account of what's going on. It's just, mm-hmm. it happens and that's it, and that just really annoyed me. Um, moving up from yeah, that I think, one... Um, I, I, I didn't look at the film as being Islamophobic, per se. Oh, it did to I... me! It did to I, me, because I... they, kept, they kept constantly talking about those attacks and putting them in such a negative light. Because they, because that because that was a was a bad thing. They didn't specifically come out. Did they specifically come out and say uh, Muslims are are all bad or anything like that? I don't I don't think so. But I can see I can see where the 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 issue is. My my issue with that film was uh, was mainly was mainly that um, when they collaborated on it, uh, they had to completely make up the lead character because whoever it's whoever it's actually based on um they don't want to blow their cover or anything like that yeah. so we'll find out in about 50 years what it really was. <laughs> so um, from... so uh but um it for something that's for something that's so incredible or supposedly so incredible it it just played off to me as boring and when it came to the final attack okay I didn't mind, I didn't mind shooting them up, but uh, uh, the uh, shooting up uh, the mosque where, or where whatever it was where uh, uh, Bin Laden was. But I did one pet peeve that got to me was when they shot those people on the street that they said may or may not have anything to do with it. I'm just like, mm-hmm. you're America, fuck yeah, we shoot people on the street. See my that point. Might not have anything to do with this. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so one up from that is something that came out this year. It's M Night Shyamalan Split. Oh boy, how about it? I saw this recently, and I don't think it holds up that well. Um, it has a night. It has an interesting concept where this guy has these different personalities in his head. Okay, fine. That's kind of nice. Um, and he kidnaps these people because all these different personalities count down to this final form called the Beast because he the Beast eats the feet or something. And James McAvoy, he's really doing his hardest doing these different personalities and stuff. But there are three strikes this movie has against it for me actually saying it's an overall good movie. The first one is that they have the they give the character this OCD kind of disorder. You know, very want everything perfect and nice and done. And they do it in such a manner that is so romanticized and over the top that it doesn't have a realistic feel to it. I know it's like, oh, you shouldn't knock it down because it's, you know, not being realistic. It's a man that has different personalities. Look, if you're going to do something on a mental disorder, at the very least, do it right to the point where we connect and understand why he's acting like this, what qualifies under these kind of actions. There's a bit where he's cutting a sandwich wrong. There's a bit where he can't see, he, he can't stand seeing dirty clothes and forces them to take their clothes off and stuff. And it's like, it's uncomfortable, but it doesn't make any sense. Um, the second strike, spoiler alert, one of the main characters keeps flashing back and she keeps seeing himself on this hunting trip when she was like eight or nine. And she's with her father and her uncle, and it's greatly hinted at that her uncle sexually molested her on the trip. Ew. Do I need to elaborate any further? If you're going to go that route of child abuse... But oh, they make a connection with the the Kevin whatever 23 personality character because he's in this mode because he was abused as a kid too... Look, if you're going to put this topic in there, put it with a point. Don't make it a shock value gimmick. Don't put it in there just for the sake of making the audience uncomfortable or forcing sympathy. Give it a point and purpose. And the third thing is that when they count down to this beast, you think it's going to be this big scary monster. And it's just James McAvoy, digitally muscular with extra veins and stuff. And it's not really scary. Yeah, there's stuff where he walks on walls and does exorcist kind of stuff, but there's <laughs> nothing really frightening about it. He he he, kill, he kills a woman in half. Okay, he eats a girl by tearing its intestines out off screen. Whatever. There's just nothing really frightening about it. There's the scene where he's talking to a psychiatrist about the beast having claws and everything, and it's like, 
all right, that's kind of interesting. And they don't go that route. And it still suffers from the tropes of the Shyamalan bits, the quirky inserts, the the, the weird things with the shots and what do they mean. Now he slowly plans from one thing to the next instead of just cutting forth. The stupid... Um, character things there's a scene where a girl's trying to get out and there's a lock you inside door and as it turns out all this time the keys were just on this coat hanger and she doesn't realize until she sees all these videos with the different personalities and stuff the only cool thing about it is that it has connections to the film unbreakable with bruce willis and they're going to do a sequel crossing over unbreakable with split and i'm more curious to see that than this movie this one had an interesting idea but the way it went out it just sort of went all clunky and stuff the only way i can see this movie salvaging itself is if at the end at the very end the big twist the big twist is that the guy with the personalities is really a good actor with dementia i think that would have been more interesting if it went in that direction the fact that he has a schizophrenia all because he's such a great actor and everything but Nope, they don't, don't go. They don't go that route. They had to go with the. They had to go with Mr. Tumnus on steroids. Yeah, he's a super villain or whatever with all these powers. Um. Next up from that, this is the midpoint, the room. By Tommy Wiseau. It's. Well, wait, 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 wait! No, no, no! That Hear doesn't me count. Out. That, Hear, that's me out. The... Hear me out! Hear me Morgan. out! Hear me out! Hear me out! Okay. Hear me out! Fuck you, hear me out. My list, shut up. If Rocky Horror Picture Show can have a cult following and be so beloved, I don't get why people like The Room. It's in midnight screenings. People go to this movie, they shout back at it, they throw spoons during the sex scenes and stuff. Um, watching this film on its own, I really don't see the enjoyment. I found it very boring very dull. There's nothing about it that just says camping is fun. And I know this because I've seen bad movies that do have that little nice sparkle tinge of campy. There's a stuff on Mystery Science Year 3000. Yeah, yeah, cheap, 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 cheap. Morgan is a cheek and cheap, 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 cheap. <laughs> okay, I've, sorry, I've, go on. I've, I've had more fun seeing this movie mocked during... Um, the soundtrack critic and uh, Lupo's reviews, because at least they point out the flaws and stuff, and it's kind of nice. But watching this film on its own, it's hard to take it so seriously. Because it's clearly they're trying to play it up for drama when it's not well shot, it's not well done. The sex scenes are a dull, are, are very dull. Hell, there's He's a beam. Or the belly button, I swear. <laughs> oh, oh, please. I, I've seen a seven minute sex scene in Roger Corman's. Raptor that's more interesting than this. Um, Ooh. Yeah. And there's a lot of bush in that one, too. <laughs> um, you're not... You, you're almost going to forget my my favorite part. The humping of the sash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that thing. He's... Yeah, he's, so they don't... he's just sort of got his head sash. I was like, ah, ah, ah. Like... What, what? This was serious? K- Kudo, that's my problem. This movie is trying to be serious. People are saying, oh, no, 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 it's enjoyably bad. It's so stupid you enjoy it. Well, it's hard because everyone is so clearly doing what they are. I don't get it. I is really it, I really is, fail to see the humor behind it. I really do. It's unintentional comedy. I don't know what Why So's on, but... I'm hoping, a... I'm, I'm hoping five years from now he will die on the way back to his home planet. Yeah, I know what he's on. He's on an, he's on an egg breakfast. All right. So originally I was going to put Ghostbusters on here, but I decided to be a little nice. And we, I cho- we, we, we do not talk about that one. So I decided to go after Paul Feig's spy because I have so many I have so many grudges against that one. I may or may not have seen this, but it's Paul Feig. Good. Uh, So we have Melissa McCarthy as the secretary, um, works for this 
spy, and when he goes missing, he, she decides to fill in for him. Okay, that's a nice idea, but it suffers because it has the same tropes every Paul Feig film has. The the Melissa McCarthy character, the the male per, the male character that wants to be better than everyone else and show that he can do things, but you know keeps failing. Um, and that's with the uh, uh, Jason Stratham character who is like, oh, I've eaten like the microchips and shadowed a computer before, and all he does is these uh, Inspector Clouseau pratfalls, which are just so lame. Um, Apparently, Powell Feig has this fascination with vomit gags, as he always does in every single film. What's the crowning achievement? There's a scene where she accidentally kills someone in a very over-the-top manner, and he, like, gushes out blood and stuff and falls down a bunch of stories and clashes, and then she spews this stew in slow motion, like, and it like comes out like someone exploding a two liter of crush orange soda and it rains down on the corpse actually seen in r-rated fashion like what's the humor like holy crap even i wouldn't go that length something like that Mm. and for a film that's supposed to be a comedy i really can't see it as a comedy when it has so many on-screen deaths with blood shooting out of people's heads and everything in such a mystifying fashion. There's a climax or whatever where they're, the villain, I guess, is shooting down uh, cronies or something like that, and you see like, little mists of red coming out of their head, and it's like, it's so over the top to the point I really can't see myself laughing at it. It's flatter comedy. Yeah, it's so hard to go around. At least with Quentin Tarantino, it's so over the top in a messy way where it is kind of sort of humorous, like um, Hateful Eight, for example. You know, with brains exploding everything. Mm-hmm. Um, this movie, no, I, I, I can't. I just can't. Here's one from my childhood, My Dog Skip. Oh, boy. We've had the, we've had the talk. It's such... I've not seen this movie, but I, I this... want to maybe sometime down the road. This is such a mean movie. We have Frankie Muniz in the 1940s. I don't know. It's like a Christmas story or Sandlot, whatever. It's that kind of movie. Um, my grandmother got the VHS tape for us when I was like 10 or something when this came out on home video and said, Oh, it just looks like a cute little movie. We haven't seen it before. Well, it looks kind of cute. So one night we gathered around the living room and popped him in, and Mom had to go out and talk to Scott at one point. Oh, we'll get to that moment. Spoiler alert. So it's really the kid and the dog, but there's so many injections of this meatful hand to it that it really, it, it really got a little too much for me. Like when he first gets the dog, Kevin Bacon um, doesn't want the dog. And is like, oh no, this is a mistake. Well, we'll get you something different. And the mother coaxes him into like keeping the dog. Um, the kid's hero is this World War II soldier who apparently is boozing and drinking up and stuff. And like, he supposedly says, oh yeah, I'm doing all these good things and stuff, blah, 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 when he really isn't. This, the last half of the movie, I will never forgive it for. Mm-hmm. There's a scene where the dog runs away because Frankie Muniz is angry at it because it intervenes a baseball game he's in, and he, like, he, he punches the dog or something, and the dog runs away. And so the dog goes to a graveyard where there's these moonshiners making illegal booze, and the dog drinks the booze. And so just as the kid waltzes in, he sees the moonshiners whack the dog in the head with a shovel. I am not I am not making this up. I am not making this up. I remember seeing that and bawling my eyes out. I was so scarred for life, because I love dogs. I remember stopping the tape at that point, running out of the porch, just crying and everything, and telling my mom what happened. And she decided to come back in and watch the rest of the movie with us. And so when we resumed it, it got to the scene where they take the dog to the hospital. The dog's like looks like he's gonna die and everything, but What's this? The dog comes back to life. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't gonna 
guy after all, and then afterwards they do an epilogue where the kid goes to college and a voiceover says, oh, Skip missed me too, and he died of a broken heart because I wasn't there for him. Fuck you, movie. Fuck you. If you're going to tug at my heartstrings that deep and pull a 360 and say, nope, 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 take that risk. Really, take that risk. At least I can give points for because of Winn-Dixie for doing that. Because one, the dog wasn't in peril. The dog didn't die in Winn Dixie. The dog mm-hmm. just sort of, the dog just sort of ran off, and it caused that minor distress. And it brought Reverend Jeff Daniels and Dakota Fanning together. So I can give that the benefit of a doubt. My uh, dog that was skin- in Dakota Fanning. That was, uh, that was, uh, uh, the the new Violet, uh, neo Violet Beauregard, that actress. Whatever. Um, no, <laughs> this movie. No, if you're gonna take a sucker punch to my heart and do that, and and really, really pull that 360, don't, please. Anna, you're, you're you're cheating yourself. Anna Sophia Rob. That's the one. Yeah. It, it, it's like having Bambi, where you think the mother's dead, and she comes back, and she's like, "It's all right. I was alive the whole time." Like. No, you don't. You don't it, do it, that. It's, uh... Yeah, that... Not, uh, if you look at it... Looking at it in that perspective, it uh, I can see why it's considerably insulting. When Dixie... Kind of like... That was kind of a TV movie, I felt like. But hey, at least they trained a dog how to smile. Yeah. <laughs> so, here's another one. Ang Lee's Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Ooh, okay. I have a love-hate with Ang Lee's movies. I think he has great visuals. The stories, on the other hand, not very interesting. And the one that pinpoints it is this one. I remember seeing this in Asian cinema, and I kept thinking to myself, oh, okay, this is kind of nice. They're on trees and everything. When they talk, they fight at the same time. That's kind of cool. But at the same time... I just kept calling shots like, okay, this is the chosen one with the green sword and everything. She has like all the powers and stuff. There's going to be a twist where apparently the mentor that she's with is actually the mother is actually the mother or something like that. And I remember during that class when they were watching that movie midway, I got so tiresome of it. I started going, uh, 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 just like softly groaning in annoyance and just scuffling papers and stuff. And so when class is over, my teacher wanted to see me because of that. He said, you know, you can't make noises when we're seeing these movies. And I explained him why I was so annoyed with it, why I was doing that, and he kind of understood. But the only reason, even I, I, even I asked my mother about this, the only reason she remembers this movie and certain people do is just because of the stunt work, which I'll give it credit. There's great stunt work. But the story is so done to death. It's been done before a bunch of times. This person has these great powers and stuff and doesn't know how to control them. Um, They're trapped between being used for good or being this evil entity. There's the big twist and everything where, oh, I am actually the mother and your dad is the good person and blah, 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 bleep, bleep, bleep. And it's like, ah. You know they're going to be irresponsible with their power and beat up some people in a bar and consider a criminal and all that sort of stuff. There were just no surprises in the story, and that's what really bothered me. I think Ang Lee is a visually masterful guy, but when it comes to his movies, his stories that he's doing are either done to death or not interesting. Life of Pi, that had some great aspects. I know it's a book adaptation. I know it is. But we get to that last act where he goes to an island full of monkeys and stuff, and the island is nice and paradisical, but there's a dark side to it. You could have just cut that out. After that long boat trip, you just want them to get to actual shore and actual land. But it's a fantasy. Things can happen and blah, blah, blah. It's like, forget it. It's in the book. Okay, I'm just going to move up and go to the last two. The Crouching Tiger, I will say this. Uh... Not yeah, not the best work maybe, no. but I'll have my own reasons later. All right, I got two left. I got two left, so I'll be able to squeeze these next eleven minutes. So I had to get some Phil Lord and Chris Miller on here, and the obvious bullseye was the Lego Movie. Mm-hmm. It's well animated. <sighs> it's well animated, but I'm sorry, I didn't laugh. 
I didn't find the characters interesting. Um, it's hero's journey. And even when they do that big twist where it's the Lego universe being played by a kid, it's like saying the entire world of... It's like doing The Princess Bride and not having the storytelling sequences with the grandfather and then revealing it at the end. It's kind of like that. Because then you feel really cheated just because of the world and environment we are in. And I really don't understand lord and miller's take on humor they feel like as if they're trying to be very mel brooksian it's not that interesting because they think it's being meta they think it's breaking the fourth wall they think it's doing these certain cliches that others have been doing when they really should focus on the humor of the characters and the humor of their situation mel brooks for example Bla- uh space balls and blazing sounds is about poking fun at the tropes of the west and the space movies um with Phil Lord and Chris Miller, one, they're adaptations, and two, they seem to be poking fun at story structure as opposed to genre structure, and that's what really annoys me. A good example is when they did 21 Jump Street, and there's a joke where um, everything's going to crap, and like Jason uh, 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 Tatum and the other guy's characters mess up Peter Pan and they get fired at the same time and expelled from school and then the director comes out and says, and that's the end of Act 2. Like, God, really? You're actually addressing the end of a story act within an actual story act? Come on! And they do that a lot in the Lego movie. They do that such a lot. It just really infuriates me. I can't remember a single joke I liked. I can't remember a single character I kind of sort of laughed at. It's just a big bundle of annoyance and madness, and it just grinds my gears. Yeah, the if you want to if you want to see a better example of that type of twist ending, I would recommend the film Haunted Honeymoon. I have not seen. Um, I have not seen uh, this uh, uh, this this movie. I I remember just looking at the trailers and saying to myself, "It looks like an eyesore." Yeah. And uh, in in terms of how the animation was done, people keep saying it. Oh, it's really kind of fascinating how this is uh, how this this movie is animated to be computer animation, but it looks like stop motion. No, it looks like very clunky, clunky stop motion. It's, uh, it's it's like something uh, uh from the guys that, at, at least at least with the cloudy movies, you could say that they hey they, uh, they know some know a thing or two about directing animation. But with um, with this, it looks very much like a, uh, like a, a, a college student animated it, a lot of the time and. Uh, in terms of in terms of the visuals and the the staging, even in the trailer, I thought it looked bland and uninteresting. Mm. So, do you have like a, a Batman movie? On the other hand, that looks a little bit more entertaining. But maybe yeah. I just like Batman. I I didn't bother with that one. Do you have a counterattack, Mike? Uh, here we go. If I can show it. I meant in regards to your thoughts on Lego Movie. I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. Um, let, me, let, me put, let, me, let me say this. What really turned me off at Lego Batman, the last thing I needed to see is an hour and 40 minutes of Robin and nothing but a green thong. Okay. So what's the big movie that I really can't stand but everybody says is a masterpiece? Here's a twist for you. Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. This much I know. I like Alfred Hitchcock. I think he's a great guy. He knows how to do suspense. He knows how to do thrillers. I like Psycho. I like North by Northwest. The Birds. I've seen some of the episodes of his TV show, and they're really good. Vertigo, it's that film that everyone says is well-made, well-shot, and yeah, much like Ang Lee, there's a lot of eye candy in this movie. There's some really beautiful, gorgeous shots, And I think that's kind of the reason why this movie was sort of made. Because the rest of it is so slow, so dull, that I really found myself checking out a lot of times. Um, 
so the whole story is about this detective that's supposed to watch over this girl and they both believe in reincarnation and at one point he tries to save her but the problem is that he's afraid of heights so when she dies she falls off of a building and he has like this big guilty conscience and then like a day or two later he starts seeing visions of he starts seeing the same girl but he doesn't know if it's the same person or someone reincarnated to look like her and what really gets my goat is that there are certain points in this movie where they reveal a twist and it really feels like it could end there but then mm-hmm. they go on and reveal another thing, and then another thing, and then another thing, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing, and then until it actually goes to this ending that kind of sort of works, but ends on such a lame climax that really makes me wonder if you're building up just to that very lame final note, then what about these other spots where it could have so easily ended? Um, without giving too much away, there's a scene where we actually see the whole thing revealed. And it's such a poignant moment. It's like you could have ended it there. Like this person wants to tell the truth behind the person who just committed suicide, but yet holds back. And then you have this other bit where um, the cop, played by James Stewart, starts dating the girl and wants to look, wants her to look exactly just like the person that died in very disturbing fashions, even to the point where he wants to see her in the same dress that she wore and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, that could have ended there. The big tragedy that the memory is still embedded and he doesn't want to let go of the past. And she's willing to, like, just go with it, even though it's very uncomfortable and setting for her. But then they just say, oh, it's just a big ploy because he knew that the whole thing was blah, 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 and bleep, bleep, bleep. And it's like, ugh, come on, Really? doing this oh and how's this spoiler alert when it gets to the ending the villain of the film is scared the villain of the movie gets killed off in the most easiest and lamest way fashion they're up in this bell tower and like the person sees a shadow and they jump off the building and it turns out it's a nun a nun and then the nun's all like oh no another death i better ring them and she starts ringing the bell and you see jimmy stewart just standing there in the window going oh my god oh oh god oh clarence oh mary oh 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 what a horrible oh it's happening again oh oh, oh. cut to the paramount logo and really that's it that's how you're gonna end it right there this uh, because slow, if they because if this, they kept on going, it would uh, it would bring them into Psycho Three territory, and they this, we'd, be, we'd be playing that movie. <laughs> this this slowly paced film that is saying we have a story, we have something, and then in the end, it just clearly doesn't because it takes so many detours <laughs> and plots itself, and has all these different ways it could end. It, it was such a frustrating experience for me. And I feel bad because Hitchcock is a great director. He really is. I think he knows how to do suspense. He knows how to do um, really beautiful stuff. But this one, I was just frustrated by the story. Like, it's a very beautifully shot film. Don't get me wrong. There's nice neon colors and stuff that come out and stuff. There's some great bits with the spiral um, vortex and everything. But, oh, yes, there's a Jimmy Stewart acid trip in the, yeah. in the film. But in terms of story, but in terms of story, this was definitely his weakest one. And to this day, I, I'm going to hold myself against it and say I was so frustrated that I was close to doing a fan of this film. Um I, I really can't say that much. I really can. That's why I have a fear of cla- of rewatching classic films, because they'll either hold up well or they won't hold up well. That's why I've not watched Casablanca, because there's other films like Casablanca. Yeah, like uh, like that one in the '90s with uh, Pamela Anderson. Oh no no I was no 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 I was no 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 I was thinking about the one with Bugs Bunny. Oh. Carrot Blanca. Oh okay. It's like, you see the parodies, and you see the actual thing, and it's like, yeah, I get why everyone was parodying it, but 
what's the point? Um, oh, oh, no, no, that's not the remake. I'm talking about the game Grim Fandango. Never mind. Focus Arts. But no, um, I can't stand Vertigo. I, I really can't stand Vertigo. It's one of those movies where it's just, it has great ambition, but it killed me. You, 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 you're, you're killing me, Hitchcock. <sighs> you're tearing me apart, Hitchcock. And to compare, at least North by Northwest, when it kept going, there was a sense of fulfillment, like Cary Grant assuming that role and everything. So at least it was building to an ending and a climax. This one just had the first two acts and had like five minutes of a climax and that was it. Mm. The birds is an exception. Wow. Okay. Well, I, what, what can I say? I'm not going to defend Vertigo. You happy? Oh, you, Mike. You got something to say about Vertigo? I haven't seen it. Oh, Mister, I'm a I'm a film I'm a film buff. I run the I run the I host this this whole show. Oh, look at me! I was better. Wee! Yoshi! Yoshi! Wee! Why would you play a song by a Nintendo character that's clearly Canadian? Because Matt's not here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm slowly building my repertoire of films, James. Shut up. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah I, gotta, I gotta make that joke well known. Whenever we played Super Smash Brothers, and whenever we played, and when we had Yoshi on deck, we always joke around saying that, Yoshi's weird. Well, that's because he's a Canadian. Yoshi's not a Canadian? Yeah, he is. He has the tongue thing. Can we get some Canadians on board to, uh, so that, to confirm that? So, so that's why we always quote it as Yoshi being a Canadian, just because of how bizarre he was. Okay. So, yes, this has been Cinema Royale. Please comment if you like these films and you want to defend them. Do that in the comments below. Also, give us your movies that you hate but everyone else loves. And... Uh, and I'm going to say right now, if you have any lovely hate mail for us for my prolonged list and their suggestions, please send all hate mail to I don't give a shit at hotmail.com. No, isn't, isn't that biteme.com? We retired that joke five years ago. Okay. We had that joke? We weren't here five years ago. Yep, it was just like yesterday. Right? It was two weeks ago. Or three weeks ago. I was wearing a mustache that day. Also, give this a like if you liked it. Share it with your friends and create a discussion, folks. And don't forget to subscribe. And, uh, yeah, thanks for listening and watching. Next time, we're going to do uh, Hanna-Barbera uh, with a few British guests. All right. So, adios, amigos. Ciao for now. The Lego movie sucks balls. It still does. I'm not going to... Feed me a rage! <laughs>